uh, Pascal Giraud, who's here from UC Santa Cruz, is uh, in the Department of Applied Mathematics. I've known Pascal for many years. She works, as you're going to hear today, on fluid dynamics, but in particular in stars and in other objects, but primarily in astrophysical fluids. I, I've really had the benefit of working with her and interacting with her over many years. She also uh, was quite generous when she uh, hired one of my former graduate students as a postdoc, Kevin Moore, who since went on to Salesforce. Uh, so he's maybe in that big tower in San Francisco now. I'm not sure. Could be. Uh, Pascal uh, has done many things, but one is she was the founding director of the Kavli Summer School for Astrophysics, which for many years was uh, dedicated to educating graduate students to learn um, different aspects of physics. And as an oceanographer, she's also part of, of course, many, or not oceanographer, ge geophysical fluid dynamicist, GFD, uh, um, of doing summer schools at Woods Hole. So Pascal is does many things, and you're going to hear about that this evening, and I just really want to thank Pascal for coming down. So Pascal made a special trip. Uh, this talk, as you, many of you know, was scheduled earlier, but she really made a special trip to come here to give this talk. So I'm really thankful that all of you came, <laughs> because this might have ruined our friendship forever. <laughs> so Pascal, over to you. Um, well, thanks for the introduction, Lars, um, and thanks all for coming. I really appreciate, um, and I hope you'll enjoy the talk. This is the first time I ever give a real general public lecture, so it was quite a learning experience for me, um, but it was a great learning experience. So this is our sky at night, a picture of the Milky Way. And every single dot of light in that picture is a star. And stellar astrophysics is the field of science that studies the physics of stars. And so I'm going to show you how, by better understanding stars, um, the scientists over the last century have been able to better understand all the intricacies of modern and classical physics. And the story here starts during the second half of the 19th century, during the Industrial Revolution. So at the time, coal was powering uh, the factories, but electricity was just getting to be the next big thing. So, for example, the light bulb had just been invented, and Nikola Tesla was uh, working on the first electric induction motor. And the scientists had just worked out the laws of thermodynamics and energy conservation, and they were turning their minds to the fundamental questions of what's light and what is matter. And with the questions of light and matter in mind, and the need for energy to power that industrial revolution. They looked at the sun and wondered what powers it, because that very simple question just could not be answered with 19th century physics. And it was really bothering to them, you can imagine. You see, we actually know the mass of the sun really well, and we also know how much energy it produces per unit time, and that's just the solar luminosity. So suppose you have some kind of energy generation process in mind, um, and you know how much energy you can get per unit mass for that particular process, say an amount E. And just to give you an example to focus the mind, consider a lump of coal. If you burn it, we know exactly how much heat we can get from it. And if you drop it from a height, you can get some kinetic energy out of it, and we know exactly how much as well. So from that information, you can estimate how long the sun can shine, assuming it is powered by that process. And it's just that really simple formula. And so doing that calculation, scientists in the late 1800s, uh, 1800, um, they figured out that if the sun was just a burning lump of coal, you could power it for 5,000 years. If it had been formed as a, a massive ball of molten rock, which is mostly what people thought at the time, and had just been cooling since the beginning of its formation, then it could last maybe, it could shine maybe for about a million years. And then if in addition, you kind of assume that the sun contracts as it cools and you can tap into that energy from the gravitation, then you can maybe make it shine for about a hundred million years. But that was it. No more, nothing else. And 100 million years was okay for a lot of people. In fact, they were very happy with it. 
Um, but they were the annoying ones, the geomorphologists like um, Lyle and Hutton, and then Darwin in the origin of species. They all argue, argued that, and they agreed with each other, that evolutionary processes, both geological and biological, had to take billions of years to take place, not 100 million, billions. And evolutionary ideas became really popular by the end of the 19th century, so much so that they could no longer be ignored. And so the Earth had to be about a billion years old, definitely more than 100 million years. And so if the Earth had to be that old, and so did the Sun, because the one thing everybody agreed on is that the Sun could not be younger than the Earth. And so here we are, 1890s, with a sun that has to be at least a billion years old, but without any known physical process uh, that would allow it to shine for that long. That was telling scientists of the Industrial Revolution that there had to be another energy source out there. It's just that it hadn't been discovered yet. So you can imagine how tantalizing that was smack in the middle of the Industrial Revolution. Uh, but everything changed with the discovery of radioactivity by Becquerel in 1896. So he discovered that inert uranium salts emitted some kind of radiation that could be captured on photographic plates. And this is that original plate or picture of it. And radioactivity was incredibly puzzling. It was basically a source of heat, a source of energy that came out of a piece of rock with nothing else. And, and so it wasn't long, it was just a few years maybe, that before this new energy source was actually proposed as a way to power the sun and to reconcile the ages of the earth and the sun. Um, today, we know that radioactivity is not what powers the sun, but it's the discovery of radioactivity that gave birth to the fields of atomic physics and particle physics, and that marked the beginning of what everybody agrees is called modern physics. And that would be quickly followed by two other really fundamental discoveries by Planck in 1900, who launched the field of quantum mechanics, and by Einstein in 1905, who introduced the world to special and then general relativity. And all three fields are crucial to how the sun and the stars work, but it would take another 40 years before they worked out exactly how. Because the very big, can't be understood without understanding the really small first. And so today, we know that the sun and most of the stars are powered by nuclear fusion. That's the conversion of four hydrogen nuclei, or four protons, into one helium nucleus. Now this releases energy because the mass of the helium nucleus is slightly smaller than the mass of four hydrogen nuclei. And so the mass that disappears in the process just gets converted into energy through E is mc squared. And gradually over time, the sun and the stars convert the hydrogen in their core into helium, producing a lot of heat that helps them shine for billions of years. Now, to get to this conclusion, however, took a lot of time. First, uh, scientists needed to understand that matter was made of atoms and that atoms themselves were made of nuclei and electrons. And that was uh, discovered by Rutherford in 1911. They also needed, of course, general relativity to get E is MC squared. And then they needed the experiments of Aston uh, to know that the mass of one helium nucleus is actually larger than four hydrogen nuclei. But once that was discovered, it didn't take very long for Arthur Eddington to realize that this could indeed be used to power uh, the sun. But there were three major problems with the idea. First, in 1920, spectroscopy, and I'll say more about spectroscopy in a minute, I'll explain what it is, um, was still a very much of a field in its infancy and a basic analysis of the solar spectrum shown here uh, seem to show that it's mostly made of Earth-like stuff and uh, roughly in the same proportions with very little hydrogen and very little helium. And so the sun was mostly thought to be made of liquid molten Earth material. 
Um, second, being positively charged, the protons would have to overcome their own electric repulsion to fuse. And they would have to be traveling extremely fast to be able to do that, much faster than what was expected in the sun. And third, the probability of four randomly moving protons to just come together right at the same time at the same place would have to be extremely small. And so even though the idea for the sun's power source was proposed in 1920, about 100 years ago, it would take another 20 years, 1940, um, until science has figured out how it could really work. Now, solving the first of these three problems, the helium and hydrogen abundance, would involve completely revisiting what we know about the universe. So Cecilia Payne was one of the very, very rare women to actually do a PhD in astrophysics in the 1920s. And her specialty at the time was stellar spectroscopy. So when you pass the solar light, the sunlight through a prism, the white light separates into the well-known colors of the rainbow, purple, blue, green, yellow, red. There's a song about it that my daughter sings. But superimposed on these colors, you have these dark lines. They are called absorption lines. Now, these absorption lines are basically photons that didn't make it to the Earth because they got captured instead by atoms that are very close to the surface of the sun. And the energy of the captured photon is used to move an electron either from one orbit to the next within the atom or to just kick it out of the atom completely. But the energy of the photon has to be just right to do that. And since the energy and the color are exactly the same, they're interchangeable for photons. This means that only photons of a certain color can be absorbed. And which is why you see dark lines, very specific dark lines in that uh, picture. And this is what's called a, solar, a, a spectrum. Now spectroscopy therefore is the science that matches each absorption line to a particular chemical element and more specifically, a particular transition in that element, um, a particular atomic transition. And so here up there, they are marked for the spectrum. You can see the different elements and you can indeed see Earth-like elements, sodium, magnesium, iron, as well as hydrogen and helium. But note how dark the line in the 20s was associated with basically uh, how many atoms from a given element there were on the surface of the sun. And this is how people used to estimate solar abundance of each element. But Cecilia Payne realized that there's something quite different about hydrogen and helium, which made it harder for these elements to absorb the photon, much less likely. And so the line that we see only represents a tiny, tiny fraction of the total amount of hydrogen and helium in the sun. And with that, she concluded that hydrogen and helium were actually the most abundant elements in the sun. And in fact, she did the same for other stars and found the same results, which meant that the whole universe was basically made of hydrogen and helium. And her results were so revolutionary and contrary to common belief at the time that no one believed her for several years. And it wasn't until somebody else had redone the calculation that it was finally accepted. But when that finally happened, the whole problem with the helium and hydrogen abundance went away. So first problem gone. The second problem, if you remember, is how to get two protons close enough so they can fuse as opposed to be repelled by their own electric field. And the solution to that problem is called quantum tunneling. And it was discovered theoretically by Hund in 1927 and then applied to this particular problem of proton fusing by Gamow a few years later. And the idea behind quantum tunneling is that particles in the quantum world have a small, very small, but non-zero probability of not being where you expect them to be. And so during their trajectory towards one another, they have a small chance of finding themselves on top of each other instead of being stuck on either side of that electric barrier. And when that happens, in the very, very rare cases where that happens, the protons can fuse instead. Sorry, okay. Uh, which solves the second problem. 
And so finally, we have to figure out the problem of getting four hydrogen, four protons together to fuse into helium. And the answer to that will require another major series of developments and this time in particle physics. So first, it turns out that hydrogen, uh, sorry, helium is not actually made of four protons uh, as it was thought in 1920s. It's made of two protons and two neutrons. And the neutrons wouldn't be discovered until 1932 by Chadwick. And this also tells us that somewhere along the way, two protons must turn into neutrons. And that reaction is called beta decay and it wouldn't be fully understood until the work of Enrico Fermi in 1933. And that, it'll be important later, involves the production of a positron, which is an antiparticle of the electron, as well as a neutrino. Now these little neutrinos are uh, neutral, so no charge, and they have almost no mass, and they really almost never interact with matter, and that will be important later. And the answer so to the last problem, namely how you get all these four particles together in the same place at the same time is basically you actually don't. Instead, the helium is built progressively in chain reactions that only ever, ever involve the collision of two particles with one another at any one time, which is a lot easier. And so as it turns out, there are several ways of doing that, which were worked out by Beta and von Weizsäcker between uh, 1937 and 1939. And there are many possible chain reactions that ultimately fuse four hydrogen into one helium, two of which are shown here, and I'm sure Lars knows them very well. Um, which one is most efficient depends on the local temperature, density, and composition of the star. Now, several of these chain reactions involve isotopes of hydrogen and helium. So you notice this is a hydrogen, but this is a hydrogen with an extra neutron, and this is a helium with minus a neutron. These are called PP chain reactions. There's also a chain, a chain reaction called the CNO cycle that uses protons to progressively grow carbon into nitrogen and oxygen that then goes back into being a carbon by emitting a helium in the process. And as you can see, uh, four protons in each case ultimately end up producing one helium and it'll be important for later, two neutrinos that came out of transforming the two protons into two neutrons. And so at last in 1939, modern physics had finally managed to solve all problems regarding the fusion of hydrogen to helium and understand what power stars. So the sun is made of hydrogen and helium. Uh, protons can indeed get close enough to one another using quantum tunneling. And then various possible chain reactions allow you to turn hydrogen into helium. But we all know that 1939 is not remembered for progress in solar physics. It was the start of the Second World War where everything in the world would change. Many of the nuclear physicists and stellar astrophysicists at the time that were involved in understanding the energy source of the sun were now asked to create nuclear bombs. And some like Beta and Fermi in the US under the Manhattan Project and von Weizsäcker for Germany. And ultimately, the Manhattan Project succeeded in creating these bombs. The Hiroshima and Nagasaki bombs uh, that killed hundreds of thousands of people were only the first generation nuclear bombs. They drew their energy from the fission of uranium into lighter elements. But in the decades following the war, it was quickly realized that much bigger and more importantly, more stable nuclear bombs could be created by using hydrogen isotopes as the main fuel instead. So basically triggering fusion reactions just the same way as they are triggered in the sun. And today's hydrogen bombs are many thousands more time more powerful than Hiroshima and their development went hand in hand with the developments in stellar astrophysics with stars serving as laboratory for the thermonuclear physics of the bombs. And so to understand the connection between stellar astrophysics and bomb physics, I'm gonna introduce the equations that model stars. And I apologize for showing equations, but I want you to understand just how tricky the problem was and why it took that long to understand uh, what works and what doesn't work. So at the basic level, stars are in what's called hydrostatic equilibrium, which is just a balance between gravity, which is trying to pull the star in, and gas pressure, which is pushing everything up. And this is the mathematical expression for 
that balance. The second equation is basically just Newton's law telling that gravity is related to the amount of mass inside the particular spherical shell where you are. That's a well-known result from classical physics. Next comes what's called an equation of state that relates the pressure of the gas to the local temperature and density and composition of the star. So that's a local equation. And while the other two are just classical physics, this one is much more complicated because it involves things like quantum mechanics, statistical mechanics, and special relativity. Um, the next equation is just a simple statement of energy conservation, saying that the energy that's passing through a particular radius in the star comes from whatever's produced inside that radius. Now, some of that energy, if you remember, is produced in the form of neutrinos, which don't like to interact with matter, so they just escape the star. The rest is produced in the forms of photons, which are absorbed by the star and therefore heated up locally. And this equation is pretty harmless, but all the nastiness is hidden in these terms, epsilon, which are basically the reaction rates, the amount of energy produced. And so there's two other very nasty equations that need to be added that describe the production rate of energy and the loss from neutrinos by nuclear fusion reactions depending on local temperature density and composition. And finally, the last equation is an, an equation that describes how the thermal energy that's produced in the core ultimately gets out to the surface. And that depends, um, that can happen in several ways. So it can either happen by successive absorption and re-emission of photons, it's called radiative transfer. And in the sun, it happens in the interior of the sun or by large-scale fluid flows, uh, which is called convective transport. And uh, in the sun, it happens in the outer part of the sun. So in the, the first part, the radiative transport requires a lot of input from quantum mechanics uh, and atomic physics to understand how the photons are absorbed and re-emitted. The second one, convection, requires a good understanding of the theory of turbulence. And so it's a branch of fluid dynamics, which I'll get back to later. So my point for writing these equations is that, oh, you can't see the difference between the colors. <laughs> They're supposed to be different colors. <laughs> that these three, this one, this one and this one, they are white on my screen. <laughs> um, they're very well established. They're basically conservation laws or basic classical laws of physics. Those in, greens on the other, those in green on the other hand, this one, this one, and this one, uh, are where all the details of thermonuclear microphysics of plasmas at high temperatures and densities are described. And that's where modern physics comes in. So that's where atomic particle physics, special relativity and quantum mechanics come in. And the equations in green are exactly the same ones that scientists use to model bombs. And so this is also the ones where in the 1940s and 50s, most of the uncertainties lie. So the point is that if you wanna better understand bomb microphysics and build a bomb, um, you can either just try your best and detonate the bomb, or you can solve these equations, make a model of star, and then compare it with what you observe from stars. So one of these options is a lot more dangerous than the other, you can guess. And so in the 1940s, stars really became a laboratory for thermonuclear physics of bombs. And at the beginning, though, it didn't work very well. These equations do not have, you can see how complicated they are. They do not have simple pen and paper solutions. And so either you had to make very dramatic assumptions to solve them with a pen and paper, and these almost turn out to be, almost always turn out to be wrong. And the first models of the sun sometimes were off by a factor of 10 or a factor of 100. Um, and then solving these equations using a computer in the 1940s, late 40s, was also really difficult because that's what computers look like in the 1940s. These were uh, rows and rows of almost exclusively female computers, each given a single step of an algorithm to perform on a hand calculator. And they would then pass on the result to the person next to them who would do the next step in the algorithm and so forth until you got the answer at the end of the row. And you can imagine that was quite a slow process. And then the beginning of the 50s was the dawn of the computer age. And at that point, it became much easier to solve these equations quickly. 
And the thermonuclear explosion calculations and these early stellar evolution calculations were all performed on the same computer because they use the same physics, the same equations. And one of them was the MANIAC computer at Los Alamos National Lab. And this is the one where they did the calculations for the 1952 bomb, uh, whose picture I showed you earlier. And by the mid 50s, uh, stellar evolution calculations uh, were becoming much more routine thanks to the MANIAC computer and advances in computing. And so there was a big collaboration between stellar astrophysicists and thermonuclear physicists who were informing each other, comparing notes, um, comparing uh, their results to stellar, to stars. And everything helped improve the computation of these green terms, the nuclear generation rate, the energy transfer rate, and the equation of state. And this is how we finally understood all of these microphysics much better. And there was another major step forward in stellar modeling that came from realizing that convection was important. And, that, and that's especially true for stars like the sun that have an outer convection zone. You see, the early stellar models typically assumed that convection was almost perfect. Uh, but Erika Vitenze realized that this would not be the case near the surface of the star. So she developed a much more sophisticated uh, theory of solar convection to address that issue. And her theory is still used in the modern stellar evolution code today. So with the improved microphysics on the one hand and a better theory of convection on the other hand, uh, stellar models at that point became a lot more accurate and a lot more reliable. Oh, I think that's my movie running. <laughs> okay, it was supposed to run earlier. It went in. Okay. And so we get to the 1960s uh, with a feeling that stellar astrophysics is mostly a solved problem. And we just have a few details to work out. And that feeling was gonna be put to the test in fundamental ways. So the 1960s was the beginning of what's called neutrino astrophysics. Now remember these weird particles I mentioned earlier that are generated whenever a proton turns into a neutron? Well, the fusion of four hydrogen into one helium, whichever way you do it, produces a set number, a set amount of energy and two neutrinos. So basically, if you know the solar luminosity, which we do, it's very easy to measure, you know exactly how many neutrinos should be produced. And so these neutrinos, if you remember, they also immediately escape the star because they don't interact with matter, which means that if you can somehow observe them, then you, get, you know something that happens in real time in the thermonuclear physics um, as you measure it, by contrast with the photons that take a really long time to get out of the star. So in other words, the neutrinos are the perfect remote sensors for thermonuclear physics in the stars. The only thing is because they barely ever interact with matter, they're really, really hard to detect. And so Ray Davis um, had been working on this problem in the late 50s and early 60s on how to detect neutrinos. And he eventually built a detector to capture specifically solar neutrinos called the Homestake experiment. It was a crazy experiment. It's a 100,000 gallon tank of chlorine-based fluid, deep, deep, almost a mile underground in a mine. And then they had to find the few atoms that had been uh, affected by the neutrinos. Meanwhile, John Bacall produced solar models and used them to predict how many neutrinos should be detected by the Homestake experiment. And in 1968, the results came in and they were compared with the theory and the verdict wasn't what they had hoped for. Davis's experiment only detecting a tiny fraction, well, tiny, maybe small fraction of the predicted solar neutrinos. And so when the theory doesn't match the experiments, there's only one thing you do, you check and you check and you check. And so the next two decades were spent checking everything, checking the experiments, redoing it with better detectors and checking the models, reviewing the assumptions of the models, redoing the model, and yet the discrepancies remain. So this plot here is from a review article by Bacall in the early 2000s, I was a grad student there, comparing his model predictions over time, but that's the dots, and to the latest neutrino measurements at the time, which is a solid line. And you can see that by and large, the data is only finding about a third of the predicted neutrinos. So then scientists began to question everything from whatever assumptions they had about the sun 
to whatever assumptions they had in, in particle physics. And in particular, stellar astrophysicists is starting to get pretty creative. They came up with ideas for why the sun wasn't producing as many neutrinos as it should. And one of the several proposed solutions was to assume that the sun was in a temporary phase where the core had somehow cooled down a significant amount to uh, reduce the number of neutrino produced. Sounds a bit like a movie plot, right? Um, that cooling had to have happened reasonably recently, at least within the last million years, so that the luminosity of the sun's surface hadn't yet changed. Because remember, it takes about a million years for the photons to get out. Another proposed solution was to assume that the core of the sun was chemically mixed. That would change the relevant importance of the different nuclear reaction pathways to creating helium that I mentioned earlier. And it would make the uh, neutrinos a lot harder to detect. And a simple way of getting a mixed score is just to assume it's very rapidly rotating, uh, much, much, surf much, much faster than the surface of the sun, which would then cause a lot of mixing. Now, both of these ideas were very problematic in many ways. Um, but when you have no alternative solutions, even the far-fetched ideas began, began to look plausible. And there was an even much wilder one out there at the time, by the way. Um, now, the idea that the sun had a rapidly rotating core was actually quite popular for a different reason with scientists studying the, the theory of gravitation. And one person who was really invested in this idea was Robert Dickey, um, because a rapidly rotating core would imply that the sun should be a little oblate like this, and not enough to be seen with the naked eye. Here, I just exaggerated it massively, but enough to affect the orbits of the planets around it, especially that of Mercury. And the sun's oblateness would cause the orbit to precess a little bit every year and gradually change. Now, Mercury is indeed known to precess, but that had actually been explained by Einstein's theory of general relativity in 1920. And in fact, it was the fact that Einstein's theory matched the observation so well that was seen as a validation of general relativity. But if the sun's indeed very rapidly rotating in the interior, then adding the precession rate due to the general relativity to the precession rate due to the oblateness would give you a result that was bigger than what was observed. And that would be seen as a uh, invalidation of general relativity. And so another theory would be needed to get uh, the observations, one that had a lower gravitational correction. And that's exactly the theory that Dickey and others were proposing. So they were very invested in making sure that the solar core was rapidly rotating. And Finding, so finding out, so you can see that finding out whether it's rapidly rotating or not had a big impact both on neutrino physics and on general relativity at the same time. So only if there only was a way of seeing inside the sun. And this is where a chance discovery made in the 60s really did change the world, but mostly in stellar physics. <laughs> now that theory would eventually help solve both of these problems, the neutrino problem and the einstein dicke conundrum. And it would also give us a, a way to see what's actually happening inside stars. So in 1960, Leighton, Noyes, and Simon observed the sun and discovered that its surface actually vibrates with a characteristic time scale of about five minutes. So this here is a more recent five hour movie that was compressed into 10 seconds showing these oscillations. Now let's see if it's gonna work. Nope, <laughs> it's completely random whether it does or not. Um, anyway, the, uh, let me do that, okay. So the black dots in this picture shows part of the sun that are moving away from you, whereas the white dots show part of the sun that are moving towards you. Um, and it would be a, another 10 years before Ulrich uh, realized that these are just sound waves excited by the convection at the surface of the sun very similar to the sound you might hear when a pot of water starts boiling. And these sound waves are trapped in an acoustic cavity between the place where they are generated and further down um, because the increasing temperature in the sun causes the wave to refract and turn back towards the surface, just like that. 
And so the sound waves just bounce around in the sun. And when you look at it from the surface, each wave trajectory in the previous slide has a very specific oscillation period uh, of roughly three to five minutes. And when viewed from the surface, it has a very specific oscillation pattern. Some of them are shown here. And that's very reminiscent of what happens in music instruments. Each instrument resonates at very specific frequencies. And each frequency corresponds to a different pattern of vibration. And some of them are, are illustrated here for this guitar. You have three different frequencies here and three different patterns. So the sun is really just one giant musical instrument. And if you pursue this analogy further, you know that the shape and the material from which an instrument is made can really give it its characteristic sound. You're not gonna make a violin out of plastic, typically, or um, a piano out of brass. And so just the same way that we can tell a lot about an instrument just by listening to it, you can find out a lot about the sun just by listening to it as well. And that's the basis of a science called helioseismology, which means the study of sun quakes. Now, during the 1980s, uh, the measurements of the solar oscillation would get better and better. And uh, Goff and his colleagues worked out the mathematical foundations of helioseismology. And with that, they were finally able to measure the temperature and rotation rate of the solar interior. And in the early 80s, the answer came in. The sun was neither cooler than, one it, that, than what was expected, nor was it chemically mixed, or was it very ro rapidly rotating? And in fact, the sun was exactly like everybody in solar physics had ever thought. So the diagram on the right here is a figure from a more recent paper in science showing the square of the sound speed here as a function of radius in the sun. And the measurements are shown as a dashed line. And the theory is shown as a solid line. And the point is that you can't see the difference, <laughs> meaning that the sun is exactly as the model predicts. Theory really works. And so the solar model was right and the sun really ought to be producing the number of neutrinos that we had thought all along, which meant that the solar neutrino problem was not a problem with the sun, it's a problem with the neutrinos. And that's a problem with particle physics. And as it turns out, neutrinos can oscillate between different states, uh, the electron, muon, and tau neutrinos. And after it leaves the sun, an electron neutrino here has an increasing probability of changing into either a muon or a tau neutrino. But the early experiments, Davis's experiments, could only detect the electron neutrinos. It couldn't detect the other ones. And so this is why he and the others could only detect a third of the predicted flux. So neutrino oscillations have actually been known for a long time, um, but people didn't like that theory very much because it required a change to the standard model of particle physics. But once helio seismology ruled out all these other solutions, this one, the neutrino oscillations had to be really seriously considered by particle physicists, however much they disliked it. Um, and eventually would give rise to a Nobel Prize in physics for these neutrino oscillations. Now, this is one of the most remarkable examples, I think, of stars being used to provide a fundamental clue to what happens in another field like particle physics. And in just the same way, helioseismology also confirmed as early as the 80s that the sun was not rotating very rapidly below the surface. So we see here on the left, one of the very early color figures of the solar rotation profile with regions in red near the equator, rotating with a period about 25 days, regions in blue near the poles rotating about 30 days, and regions in yellow here rotating with a period about 27 days. Now to have any, measure, any measurable impact on the solar ablateness, and so the precession of mercury, the solar interior would have to be rotating about 10 times as fast as that. And so these measurements showed that the sun couldn't be uh, as oblate as suggested by Dickey, which then meant that the precession of mercury was indeed due to Einstein's theory of general relativity. And so this was the ultimate validation of this theory. And the second time, I think in stellar astrophysics, 
that it was used as a fundamental way of verifying uh, one of the pillars of modern physics. And then over the years since, there have been many times where uh, stellar physics was used to validate either quantum mechanics or special or general relativity, um, but not always in ways that are kind of as easy and visual to, to explain. So where, that, where does that leave us now? Well, uh, so what do we have left to learn from stars in the 21st century? And my very personal opinion, of course, because that's my job, <laughs> I will argue that the next frontier is stellar fluid dynamics. When you think of fluids, especially here in Santa Barbara, you probably think ocean waves, or uh, after today, your wine glass, and maybe a coffee. <laughs> And if you are a nerd like me, you may even wonder whether your cats are fluid. Um, but really, the most important fluids on Earth are the water in the ocean, the air in the atmosphere, and the liquid iron in the Earth's core. Now, the fluid motions in the ocean and atmosphere, as we all know, control the Earth's climate, and the fluid motions in the core generate the Earth's magnetic field which protects the atmosphere from cosmic rays. And all together, they make the Earth habitable for life. And stars, with very few exceptions, are completely fluid. Let's see if that one works. But the amazing thing is essentially the same equations that describe the fluids, how fluids on Earth move and how fluids in stars move. This here is the Navier-Stokes equation including mass conservation. And here we go. That's convection, solar granulation in the sun, and that's convection in soup. So fluid dynamics is truly universal. And as a result of that, many of the same physical processes that we observe in stars uh, or on Earth also exist in stars. So in particular convection, like I just showed you, but also on much larger scales. So for example, stars have large scale winds going eastwards or westwards, and that's pretty much what this shows. And these are very reminiscent of the easterlies and westerlies in our Earth's atmosphere. And stars also have large scale latitudinal flows that transport fluid from the equator to the pole and back. And that's very reminiscent of some of the large cells in the Earth's atmosphere as well, one of which is known as the Hadley cell. And so there are many interesting science questions in fluid dynamics on Earth and in the stars, but the most important one is the problem of turbulence. And here I'm not talking about airplane turbulence, although the two are related. I'm talking about the concept of turbulence in which large scale fluid motion generates smaller and smaller scale fluid motions. And uh, everything is very chaotic and very unpredictable, just like the weather. And turbulence was described by Feynman, the well-known quantum physicist, as the most important unsolved problem in classical physics. And I'm going to argue that even though it's a classical physics problem, it's one that we can only begin to solve now with all the tools of modern supercomputing, especially when it comes to stars. Um, now, turbulence has three important effects in fluid dynamics. Uh, first, it creates drag, and we'll, we've experienced drag in a car or biking. Um, it can help mix things of different chemical compositions with uh, together. And you've experienced that when milking, when putting milk in your coffee. And finally, you can help amplify magnetic fields um, through what's called the dynamo effect. So that transforms kinetic energy into electromagnetic energy, just like your bike dynamo does, but this time using fluid motions. And so on Earth, uh, the turbulence in the Earth's core generates the Earth's magnetic field by the dynamo effect. And the turbulence in the ocean transports salt and heat, and the turbulence in the atmosphere transports moisture and other chemical elements. And overall, it controls the flow speed of the atmospheric jets and the ocean currents. And all of these together play an important role in controlling the climate. Uh, but exactly by how much is difficult to tell because we don't understand turbulence that well. So similarly in stars, the turbulence generates magnetic fields. So here we see them at the surface of the sun. These are sunspots and coronal loops. And we know they also exist in other stars um, through various other observation techniques. 
Now, the main source of turbulence in stars is convection, which I already introduced earlier, and that helps transport heat from the interior to the surface. Now, some stars like the sun have uh, surface convection zones, and we can see here some of the granulation pattern. Now, as it turns out, if the sun was much more rapidly rotating, and in fact, there are many, many very rapidly rotating stars out there, um, that would change enormously what the convection looks like. And it also changes a lot the efficiency of heat transport. And yet stellar evolution models right now are not really taking that into account. Uh, stars that are more massive than the sun have a convective core instead of a convective surface. And so the convection in the core is transporting heat outwards, but it's also helping transport hydrogen back in the core, which then helps uh, fuel more nuclear reactions and help the star live a lot longer. And then turbulent drag between different layers of a star is also very important because it regulates the speed at which the surface and the core rotate with respect to one another. So during most of the life of a star, the, the surface and the core rotate almost at the same speed. It's the case for the sun, for example. But as the star approaches its end of life, the core shrinks a little bit. And as a result, it spins up just the way an ice skater spins up when they bring their arm closer to their body. Meanwhile, the envelope expands enormously and as a result, it slows down a lot. And this results in a lot of turbulence between the core and the envelope, and that turbulence then slows down the core with respect to the surface. And ultimately, it's the turbulence drag that tells us what the rotation profile of a star is as it approaches its end of life. And in particular, it's going to tell you how fast the final product a rotating white dwarf, a rotating neutron star, a rotating black hole, how fast these are going to be rotating. And knowing how rapidly black holes are rotating as they're formed is really important to the interpretation of data from gravitational wave detectors that are coming on right now, and all the new science of gravitational astrophysics, gravitational wave astrophysics, which is a really fascinating development that we've had in the last few years. And so all of these examples should give you a sense of why turbulence is important in the life of stars. And the big question that stellar astrophysicists are grappling with is how to model it. So in the same way that geophysicists are trying to model the effect of turbulence on Earth to understand the climate. And the big problem is that studying stellar turbulence is pretty hard because you cannot experiment with stellar fluids. I mean, it should be self-evident, but everything about stars, for example, is just so big. A single one of these granules is as big as France. And even if scale didn't matter, and it really does, um, the properties of stellar fluids are actually quite different from the properties of Earth fluids. So the only way to study stellar fluids is to use computers. Now, this is one of the several uh, computers that are funded by the National Science Foundation, on which scientists like myself study stellar fluid dynamics. Um, and we do what is called numerical experiments. And this computer is about a trillion times faster than the maniac computers that they did these early set of structure calculations on. And yet it's far too slow to model all the fluid motions in a star. So as a scientist, we have to make modeling choices. So we can either model the whole star, but in doing so, you can't resolve all the tiny scales of turbulence, and we have to make assumptions for what these do. Or we can model a tiny region of a star and do so much more accurately and resolve all the scales. It's not working again. <laughs> it was working early. Oh, yeah, yeah, okay. Um, but then by reducing everything to a tiny box, you can't really see how that impacts the whole star. So neither of these approaches is perfect and there are pros and cons to both. And you'll find as many people advocating one way as you find people advocating the other. But the key is that in both cases, uh, you have to use stellar observations to validate the numerical experiments. So this is where stars become laboratories for extreme fluid dynamics. So in the first case, you can directly compare the results of the numerical experiment with observations. So for example, when modeling 
convection in a rotating sun, you can try and reproduce the solar rotation profile that I showed you earlier. And this in the middle here is one of the latest results comparing the results of experiments, numerical experiments to the data. And uh, the agreement is getting reasonable. Now the numerical experiments are having a fast equator and a slow pole, but there's still a lot of detail to work out. In the second case, let's see if this one works. Uh, the small box experiments are used to create models for the turbulent drag and for the turbulent mixing rates of chemicals. And these are then implemented in the stellar evolution code. Just, oh, here it is. <laughs> um, just like the MESA code developed here. Somehow MESA is not coming up. Here we go. <laughs> By uh, Bill Paxton and Lars Bilstein and a lot of other people in the world. That code makes prediction as to what the star structure and composition and magnetic fields and rotation ought to look like. And it's these predictions from the code that are then compared with observations to verify and validate the turbulence models. And again, here I would say that we're getting better and better, uh, but there's still a lot of work to do, which is gonna keep us really busy for the next few decades. And so as I'm wrapping up, we're here in 2022, studying stellar fluid dynamics with supercomputers like Stampede. And I see a lot of parallels with the way scientists used to study stellar structure in the 1950s using supercomputers at the time like Maniac. In both cases, we run numerical experiments to make predictions for what stars ought to look like with some model assumptions. Then we compare them with observations to figure out if these model assumptions were correct. So the stars in both cases are laboratories. And, and then I have a somewhat personal perspective on that. Now in the 1950s, the development of stellar physics went hand in hand with the development of nuclear bombs. And to, today I would hope that instead of learning how to destroy the planet from stellar astrophysics, we actually use what we learned about turbulence maybe to save it. Because some of the progress that we make in understanding turbulent drag and turbulent mixing in these wild environments that are stars also inevitably gives us clues to how to model turbulence on Earth. And this, as I explained before, is really crucial to better understanding the climate, and in particular, uh, to predict what's going to happen in the context of climate change. So thank you. Wonderful talk, Pascal. Questions? John. Can you use the periodic solar eruptions to calibrate the constants in your hydrodynamic solar equations? Are you talking about the coronal ejections that they're talking about? Or are you talking about the solar cycle, the 11 year solar cycle, both? I think the answer is yes. So there are, in, instead of running these numerical experiments, right? people create much simplified models of the fluid dynamics where everything is parameterized. And then you can tweak the parameters to indeed try and capture the period of the solar cycle. So that's uh, something that's done quite a lot actually. Yeah. This is a language related question. Um, if with all the greatest new computers, you could finally solve turbulence, what would you call it? It would no longer be turbulent, would it? <laughs> I mean, I think, you know, it, it's a bit cheeky to say turbulence is a problem um, because there's as many flavors of turbulence as there are physical processes you can add to a fluid. You can add rotation, magnetic field, you can add chemical stratification, and then you have an infinite parameter space to play with where the turbulence is going to look different. So turbulence in stars does look different from turbulence on Earth. So we're never going to really solve the whole turbulence. I think we can make way in studying very specific types of turbulence. Eckhart studies one of them, I study another one, and then really understand that one part very well, and then move on to the next one and understand that one very well. So I think we'll 
make progress bit by bit in understanding turbulence in all its different forms. Sure. Here you've got a lot of molecules relating to each other. So take a simple take a simple situation where you have three orbiting bodies, the three body solution. Okay. And uh, and you can't predict what it's going to do. Mm -hmm. And here you've got billions of bodies, and it's it's not a it's not a a, a complicated problem. It's a complex problem. So you've got the complexity theory where where the things change based on, on what the other things are doing. So, I mean, is it a solvable problem? Or, or, or can you do it with just the mathematics of trying to model it? Or, or are there other ways that you might be able to, 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 to look at it and aggregate it? Are there some other tools, perhaps, instead of our traditional ones, of trying to build a formula for it? Maybe you can't build a formula for it. Well, so the equations that I showed, the equations of fluid dynamics, they don't have any pen and paper solution. They are chaotic and unpredictable. But what you can do is understand the behavior from a statistical sense. So on average, what does convection do? So in that sense, you can study turbulence um, in whichever form, either with numerical simulations like I showed. So you run a numerical simulation, you wait for a long time, and you get a good statistical sense of what it does over time. There's also really interesting formal mathematical theories that are called bounding theories, where you're trying to, and my grad student is very invested in that, where you're trying to estimate what's the maximum amount of heat that you can get out from convection, for example, um, and, and similar questions like that. What's the maximum amount of drag that you can get from turbulence? And these mathematical theories are really interesting because they get you an absolute maximum. They might not get you the actual value, but they, they get a sense of what's the best case scenario. Right? So these are the two approaches. Numerical simulations get you a statistical but experimental way of looking at the problem, and mathematical theories give you an exact but not very accurate because often your maximum is higher than the truth, right? You can, you can follow the energy, for example. Right. Mm -hmm. I'm almost not sure how to ask this question. Okay. Um, because you're trying to learn, understand the physics behind this and everything, starting with the physics and, and trying to do things like Mesa does and, and getting very pretty movies out of it. That's one thing, but when I look at the, 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 the diagram on the left, the picture on the left, I'm reminded of the sorts of things that people are already doing with machine learning to model complex systems, things like protein folding, which is a very hard problem. But it won't teach you the physics, right? Even if it ended up being a pretty good simulation. Is anyone thinking about that at all that you know of? You mean of using machine learning to inform fluid dynamics? To try and model that and then maybe intuit what the physics must be after that. I think there was a program not that long ago on this topic, so the machine learning of fluid dynamics. And there's a big, um, I would say, spectrum, I should use it in that sense, in the people who really just use pure machine learning without trying to inform the outcome with the physics and those that really work with the physics and just use machine learning a little, a little bit, right? So it, it's all over the place. But yes, definitely machine learning is being used. Now, in the context of stellar astrophysics, I have not seen it. Yes, but that doesn't mean it doesn't exist. You know, it's just a very recent field. Is there a such a thing as an astrophysical rentals number where you can predict uh, the transition from laminar to turbulent flow, since we're talking turbulent flow here? I think you're talking about Reynolds number. Yes. Is that correct? Yes. yes. Yeah. Reynolds um, The fluid is quite agnostic about what it's made of in a sense. And so, because the equations of fluid dynamics that I showed you, the only thing in there that's fluid specific might be the density or the viscosity or, and that's captured in this concept of Reynolds number. So yes, the Reynolds number is a concept in astrophysics. It is used in just the same way as it is in geophysics. And if you're asking me, you know, what's the Reynolds number of, of this sun? It's enormous. We're talking 
10 to the 15, 10 to the 18. And that's why these simulations are extremely difficult, right? Um, now, if you're looking at these simulations down here in little boxes, because I have a very little box, my Reynolds number is much smaller. So that's why it's doable. I hope I answered the question. I'm not sure I understood it completely. This might be a very simple question, so it might just be yes or no, but you talked about how um, there are stars that are rotating at the same um, frequency, both on the outside and the inside, so, and they're mostly rotating quickly. Are there stars where the outside and the inside are rotating at the same speed, but they're rotating slowly? Yeah, definitely. Thank You'll you. find everything in stars. <laughs> the, the thing is, there's so many stars out there. <laughs> Can pretty much imagine something and it's there. <laughs> right. Well, I want to thank Pascal one final time for this wonderful talk.